given a moment in which the question of truth is asked. And then the moment comes in which parents or teachers or ministers must deal with children in a quite different way. Then they must try to interpret these symbols, to give their meaning, to show that they are not fairy tales, but that they are not events either, which you can describe as you can describe a battle of the past or a person of the past, but that they are expressions of men's relationship to what is infinitely serious. And this is the period where often the parents and equally often the teachers uh, simply fail. They, they are not able to do this with that wisdom which is necessary. I have heard of uh, Sunday school teachers who if a child raises his or her finger and asks such a question, he or she is scolded and asked to keep silent. Now I would say uh, in this moment, if by chance I came into this class, I would dismiss this teacher the same day, the same hour. She wouldn't even have the possibility to continue this one hour, so angry I would become. She has then to explain and has not to dictate and to say you must believe that. I think this is one of the greatest evils in the uh, great churches of today, that they don't take the question of the children seriously. I take them so seriously that even when I come to my most difficult philosophical problems, I often quote children's question because the children know more about uh, the immediate problems than the spoiled philosophers in many cases. And then, if this is done successfully, then we come to the third step in which we can again speak and live in the great classical symbols, but we can live in them now knowing that they are symbols, that uh, the problem is not uh, whether this or this has happened, whether God exists or does not exist, but the problem is what does all this mean for the meaning of my life. Now this is a schematic process of religious education, but this gives me also the key for the meaning of faith in mature people, because in mature people the same stages always reappear. There's always moments in which one is inclined to accept everything in a kind of superstitious uh, subjection to authorities. Then there are moments in which one is inclined to doubt of everything. And uh, these moments are then when maturity speaks to us <coughs> as an ideal. And then the third stage in which faith is there we are grasped by it, but it is not belief in something or something not, but it is a, a surrender of the whole personality to the meaning of life, which is expressed in the symbols we have now understood in these three stages. You uh, speak of the second stage, the critical stage. Uh, I think perhaps that you would say that when young people are dealt with wrongly in the second stage, this produces a kind of guilt in human life which is unhealthy. Now, one of the forms in which we encounter this at the present time in the American culture is in terms of the consciousness of status and all that goes along with this and the great pressure for conformity in young people. Do you see a certain parallel here where young people begin to doubt the value of this status consciousness and try to break out of it. Should this perhaps be dealt with in the same way as religious doubt? Yes, no, I, I wouldn't uh, even question this. It seems to me absolutely clear. And I think even these two things often belong together. There are cultural situations 
where the conformity is at the same time a religious conformity. And therefore, religious doubt and doubt about the whole state of uh, conformist society is one and the same doubt. And uh, I, uh, of course, would say that we have to deal with it uh, in the same way. I would generally say a boy who never was a rebel against the conformity of parents, teachers, and uh, the surrounding society never can become something important. He uh, uh, must have uh, in a special period his doubt. And now some people say, all right, I will agree with you in some period the child or the young man must have the period of rebellion, but after a certain time this should stop and then he should become a good, lovable conformist. And uh, I would say no. The greatest rebels were rebels their whole life. The Christians, the early Christians, the prophets, the reformers, uh, the mm, early Franciscans, and I can say many others who were great rebels when they were mature, because then the institutions in which they lived uh, were understood by them in all their negativities and they rebelled against them. So I would say criticism and uh, doubt belong to the total development of a sound life and I may add, I call this my Protestant principle. I wouldn't uh, want to ask you to play the role of a prophet, but do you think that it's possible if the sociological analysis which is giving, being given to us at the present is accurate and the pressures toward conformity are as great as we are being told, do you think that it's possible that we may be creating some kind of national neurosis or perhaps neurosis in the whole of Western culture with this? I think your question is already an understatement. We have done this already. And uh, I believe that the innumerable individual cases of neurotic behavior are expressions of this, this universal neurosis. And may I add here something? It is a very uh, logical uh, question you asked when you asked about the relation of conformity and neurosis. Because what is neurosis? Neurosis is the escape from facing reality as a whole. Uh, people are too weak to face reality as it really is. And so they withdraw. And they withdraw, as I like to say, to some place of safety, to some castle. This is a very good withdrawal, very useful for them for the moment. The whole of life uh, doesn't uh, bother them anymore, and they have their safety in a limited relationship to life. And now the neurotic action follows. They defend this limited uh, place on which they are able to live against the whole of reality. We call that defense mechanism in psychoanalysis, or we call it compulsory self-restriction, or compulsory dependence on one element in oneself. Now, this then leads, if it is done by larger groups of the society, necessary to this limited way of looking at life, as for instance many suburban communities besides our big cities today do. You have a very definite form of life, definite form of thinking, and you can stand life on this basis. But if somebody comes, you call him a prophet, and uh, tries to disrupt this conformity, then he, of course, is toned as all prophets were, because he takes away their fundamental safety belt. <coughs> Dr. Tillich, there's a, an area in which you have done a lot of thinking and writing, uh, which I would like to get in a question or two about uh, at this point. Uh, that is the area of art. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask you first, uh, what was the basis of your original interest in this field? 
Yeah. I can tell you this exactly. It was in the trenches of the First World War.